Hi, Keith. Hey, Jesse. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Oh, good. No complaints. Yeah. How uh, today going? It's going well. Yep. Yeah. Getting rolling. Nice. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're waiting on uh, folks to, to come on into our meeting here. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on today's agenda. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker with us here today, Keith Williams, we're excited to hear from. Um, and he is one of two remaining speakers in our series uh, before we pivot to our discussions about testing uh, at the end of August. So I'm waiting for uh, subcommittee folks to come in. There's David, hello. And uh, we'll just wait on a few others. In the meantime, we need to do a bit of housekeeping. So we'll have about 10 minutes of uh, minutes review and discussion edits if necessary from our last meeting, hopefully approve those minutes, um, housekeeping updates on the agenda. And then we'll hear from Keith, followed by a discussion with the subcommittee and members of the full board and end with some public comments. Um, a reminder on the public comments, if you're interested in submitting your comments, you'll have two to three minutes. Uh, they are comments, so any questions that you pose will be rhetorical for consideration, um, not discussion based with our speakers. And if you intend to submit comments, please do so via the chat function to Nick Riley by 12 p.m. Let's see, do we have more subcommittee members? Jesse, uh, I'm here now. I see Mason is coming on. Uh, I'm going to have to be jumping off and on, so I will be here for the initial quorum and to vote. Then you'll see me disappear and hopefully come back. Understood. Thank you. There's David. Hello, Mason. Good morning. There's, oh, that's Angie. I'll be waiting for Angie Carter. Jesse Sweet, Angie Alby, or Nick, did any of the subcommittee uh, contact you about attendance today? No? All right. Well, we have three. No. One, two, three of six. We have half. We'll give it a few more minutes before I we trickle go. in. Do, do we need a quorum for a presentation? We do to vote. Again, I'll, I'll be disappearing, but I can't. I will be back later. I, I'm juggling a number of things, but up oh, here's Angela Carter. There's Angela Carter. So we're at quorum, and we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Angie Carter to uh, to help us lead our discussion today. But first, I wanted to um, ask if there are any questions. If did did folks have a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting? Any questions or comments, additions for minutes? Can we get a movement for the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Awesome, our minutes are approved. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Angela Carter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad to see you all here. Thank you for joining. Um, we have a wonderful speaker here today. Uh, Keith Williams is joining us. And I will give you a little bit of information, introduction to Keith to start us off. So Keith Williams is currently finishing his PhD in Educational Studies on Indigenous Food Systems Transformation at St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. Uh, Keith also works as the Director of Research and Social Innovation at FTNI, which is formerly the First Nations Technical Institute. Um, Keith is of Scottish, Mohawk, and Dutch descent. Much of his career has been at the intersection of adult and higher education, community development, sustainable food systems, and indigenous knowledge related to plants and fungi. Keith has a master's in mycology 
and has worked on fungal related projects looking at traditional ecolo e ecological knowledge, sand dune fungi, ectomycorrhiza, edible and medicinal fungi of the non as non timber forest products. And he will be participating in a residency this fall with a poet and visual artist on Sable Island, Nova Scotia, looking at interspecies communication between fungus and humans and maybe other non-human persons as well. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Keith. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Is Thank there you so anything much. you need before we get rolling as far as uh, privileges for share a screen or uh, you know it looks like it looks like I can share my screen um, so I might awesome. I might try to do that uh, okay. in a second um, but okay. thank you thank you so much for that introduction Angela um, and so I'm just going to share okay It's just taking one second. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Angela. And thanks to all of you for inviting me to share some of my perspectives on psilocybin and indigenous knowledge. Um, a special thanks uh, to both Angela and Jesse. I've had some really interesting and inspiring um, conversations with both of you over the past month or so. So I've, I've really enjoyed that. Um, so... Yeah, I guess uh, here's my list of topics for the next uh, 30 minutes, and we've already done the introduction. Um, so my disclaimer is this, uh, anything that I present here um, are my views alone and not the views of the university where I'm completing my studies uh, or, or where I'm working my current workplace. Um, also, I have no financial ties um, or any other ties uh, to business interests in the psychedelic domain, including uh, no dealings with those involved in psilocybin, uh, no investments and no patents so really no like no no um no stake in that on that sort of financial level um and i should say actually before i continue uh if there's any issue with the sound uh please let me know and um and i'll just i don't know maybe put my face closer to the screen or or talk a little bit louder or something so just yeah just feel free to let me know if there's an issue with that at all or any other issue for that matter um so I guess some of the uh, some of the images in this presentation are my own, and other ones are not. And I've included an attribution slide at the very end of this slide deck, um, and uh, and also uh, I cite a number of papers or other resources, and those those are all included at the very end. And I'm quite happy to share this presentation uh, with uh, with with all of you, you know, uh, when when we're finished, uh, like the PowerPoint version of it. Um, so I guess so now that we've done the disclaimer, I guess uh, I'll start with the land acknowledgement, talk a little bit about um, indigenous notions of territory and relationality, uh, a little bit about the colonial legacy. And so that can help uh, help to sort of maybe frame our understandings as to why indigenous people may not trust government and government initiatives. Um, and then um, and then talk a little bit about uh, very briefly about ethnomycology. Um, contemporary uses, even more briefly, contemporary uses of fungi by indigenous people. And then yeah, I've given a little bit of thought to some suggestions um, uh, for yourselves, but also for you know anyone who's involved in the decriminalization movement or the legalization of sacred plant medicines or fungal medicine movements. So, uh, so I guess with that, um, maybe we can start with the, uh, the land acknowledgement. So um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are here on Turtle Island, and North America is called Turtle Island because uh, turtles figure prominently in many indigenous creation teachings. I live in Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq, the unceded ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people, but I also, right here, uh, but I also have one foot in Ontario or the Great Lakes region, which is known as the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon uh, refers to a pre-colonial treaty between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, which foregrounds the importance of respecting the land uh, that sustains us. So I'd like for everyone to take a moment now um, to reflect a little bit on what it means to recognize and respect the first peoples of the place where, where we all live and how we can all work together um, to be better continental citizens of, of Turtle Island of this place.
Okay. Um, so the uh, Osage scholar Robert Warrior in uh, 1999 provocatively suggested that topo or place or territory is, uh, is the kind of the fundamental underpinning of indigenous philosophy. And that's in, in contrast to, uh, to uh, logos or reason, which, uh, which is the foundation of Western thought. Um, and so over the next couple of slides, I hope to, you know, to help, help show a little bit more about how that, that's the case. And, and then we can contextualize that a little later in terms of the recommendations. Um, so land, really land is the fulcrum upon, uh, upon which indigenous philosophy and our traditional uh, life is, is based. And this is why, um, I don't know if you've heard of the land back movement, but this is why it's gained so much traction in the indigenous community or indigenous world. It's because really that's at the heart of everything. And it's, it's not just, you know, a place to live, but it, it underpins um, our, our outlook and our relationships with each other and with, with the more than human. So, okay. So, uh, Haudenosaunee traditional teachings maintain that children are formed from clay or earth and that we should walk gently upon the earth for we're treading on the faces of our un own unborn generations. And, you know, you know, I think it's perhaps a little easier to view that metaphorically um, uh, rather than literally, but either way, I think it's, it's um, for me, it's a pretty meaningful or impactful kind of quotation. Um, indigenous scholars, Vindeloria Jr. and Winona Leduc both describe land as the, uh, the ontological or fundamental framework for understanding the interdependence and interbeing between uh, animate and inanimate uh, creatures. Uh, Glenn Coulthard, Dene scholar, sees land as identity, as constitutive of who we are as a people, and also land as relationship. Uh, Joe Sheridan and Dan Longboat invoke Gregory Kahiti. Oh, actually, I think that's the next slide. Is it? Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, so uh, Jared Redekop, who's a, a non-Indigenous scholar, has done some work with the uh, Anishinaabe people in North America, but also with some folks in the Amazon. And uh, he, um, he has sort of come up with this idea that things based on his work and his, what he's learned from those folks, things become what they are uh, on the basis of a prior network of relationships. So he calls that relational coherence. Um, Joe Sheridan and Dan Longboat invoke uh, to a scholar Gregory Kahiti, Kahiti in asserting that, and, and this is a quotation, thinking and believing in a diverse minds that assemble ecosystems allows humans to understand what their animal teachers and spiritual helpers guide and instruct in the ways of being on the continent. So indigenous relationality is embodied and placed and it's entangled with all of our relations with more than human. Um, I'd like to take a moment and share a teaching that was shared with me by Suzanne Brandt, a Haudenosaunee knowledge keeper. Um, for the Haudenosaunee, even an object as quotidian as a kitchen table, or adeguara in Mohawk, exemplifies almost boundless possibilities for multiplicity and relationality. The wooden table in question is composed of all the interactions that it had as a tree in the forest, as wood in the workshop, as a table used for eating or other purposes, but also as uh, food for insects, fungi, and other decomposers when it eventually breaks down <clears throat> and returns to the ecosystem. The aforementioned table is never, it's never dead. It's always vibrant with energy, constantly transforming itself into different forms and different lives. The table described here is living and is part of life's continuance, even though it would be considered non-living or dead by Western standards. Um, things are not just things, but a dynamic network of relations, past, present, and future. And so, I would actually, in a way, I would even return to Redekop's definition of relational coherence and add a little bit, um, add a little bit more uh, temporal nuance to that. And, and instead of saying a prior network of relationships, I would even say prior contemporary and future network of relationships, especially when we consider uh, the cyclical nature of time in indigenous thought. Um, okay, so. Uh, so yeah, the next three slides, I thought it would be, in a way, I thought it would be remiss if I didn't go into some of the, um, the different policies and, and legislative tools that, that have been used as instruments of, of, um, of colonization, uh, because really that, um, you know, that, that, that kind of intergenerational trauma, it, um, it reverberates even today. And then many, in many cases, you know, there are still holdovers today. And so I think, you know, if, if there's, if you find that there's ever, 
issues in reaching indigenous communities in Oregon, you know, some, some of these, these things may be the reasons why. And I think it's just super important, especially if, you know, if you represent a government group to, um, to approach folks with a great deal of sensitivity. Um, so the British North America Act, which is, uh, oh, and I should back up and say, uh, a number of my examples here will be based on the Canadian context, um, which I call Turtle Island North but also uh, much of it applies in, in the U.S. as well. Uh, maybe just the names of some of the acts and policies are a little different and the dates might be a little different. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that too, but the focus will be on Canada. So the British North American Act, also known as the Constitution Act of 1867, established the Canadian federal government's jurisdiction over Indigenous peoples. Uh, the Indian Act um, also rendered important ceremonial activities. Oh, actually, sorry, I should back up. Um, Yeah, so the Indian Act of 18, 1876 included provisions for the establishment of reserve lands equivalent to the United States reservation lands uh, for habitation and use by Indigenous peoples. Reserve lands are, without exception, a fraction of a given First Nations traditional territory, and the relocation of Indigenous communities to reserves often dislocated people from their traditional hunting, gathering, and agricultural grounds to, to far less productive sites. Um, it's worth mentioning two pieces of U.S. legislation regarding Indigenous peoples. Um, so the Indian Removal Act of 1830 authorized the federal government to forcibly remove southern U.S. tribes to federal territory west of the Mississippi. The infamous Trail of Tears was an outcome of this legislation. This act, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and the uh, <clears throat> strangely named Non-Intercourse Act of 1834 um, led to the development of the reservation system in the U.S., the Indian Termination Act of 1953, which is actually, I mean, that's quite recent when you think about it, um, sought to dismantle the indigenous tribes and re relocate all of the indigenous people from tribal lands and immerse them completely in mainstream America. So, I mean, that's really, when you think about it, that's really a, you know, evidence of that kind of assimilationist agenda. Um, the Canadian Indigenous, or sorry, Canadian Indian Act also rendered, also rendered important ceremonial activities such as the potlatch system in the Pacific Northwest, legal. The potlatch ban was lifted in the 1930s in the United States and a little bit later in the 1950s here in Canada. The potlatch system serves multiple important functions, including negotiating land tenure for hunting, fishing, and gathering, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, contributing to overall social cohesion. So thankfully, you know, the potlatch has been revived in many, in many regions. Um, so enclosed in the reserve system and forbidden to engage in sustaining traditional ceremonial activities, indigenous people have been restricted to a panoply of surveillance and disciplinary measures um, conforming to what you, you might describe as Foucault's notion of governmentality. <clears throat> okay, um, so sensational and fabricated anthropological research conducted in the early 20th century, and this, this follows from some of the discussion on the potlatch, uh, described human sacrifice in Puebloan communities. Um, and that was used by New Mexico state legislators to bolster laws limiting uh, freedom of religious expression, again, furthering that assimilationist agenda. Um, policies resulting from Western research have been used to justify other aspects of colonization, such as the dispossession of indigenous people from their territories, um, as we discussed uh, earlier, uh, murder, and also the forced sterilization of indigenous women. <laughs> um, so the Indian education policy, which was introduced in the late 19th century, included the adoption of the residential school model across Canada. Uh, and I believe a uh, primary architect of that, of that system, Pratt, was, uh, was based in the Dakotas, and, and it, it, it applied right across um, the continent. Um, a similar movement in the U.S. started around the same time, but rather than residential school, the U.S. schools were Native American boarding schools, but really very similar experiences. Um, historian Ian Mosby recently uncovered a series of nutritional experiments that were conducted on Indigenous youth without consent from the children or their parents. Between 1942 and 1952, almost 1,000 Indigenous youth interned in Canadian residential schools were purposely malnourished as unknowing participants in state-sanctioned uh, nutritional research. And so, you know, really these abusive programs have wide ranging multi-generational effects with uh, physical and psychological traumas that are still unfolding today and really for the foreseeable future. Um, the last um, residential school closed in the 1980s 
and uh, you know I don't know if if you know if if you're aware of this or not, but um, within the past I would say couple of months, there have been what some people describe as horrific discoveries here in Canada of, of the bodies of, of you know these babies basically you know neglected or killed in the residential school system and and you know unmarked mass unmarked graves and it's really it's really quite horrible and I think for you know for all the folks who you know who, who are part of those lineages it's I mean I was you know when this happened I was you know I was busy working with some folks from the west coast um, indigenous nation and many of them had uh, had parents uh, that were in this that had been in this system so you know it was very it's very traumatic for, for a lot of people um but uh, overall i would say you know there's really it's obvious i mean there's really a history of broken promises which adds insult to the existential injury of the state sanctioned genocide perpetuated against indigenous indigenous peoples of, of Island. and so i just think you know it's really i mean i know it's it's kind of a it's a hard thing to talk about but um i just think I, as as you look at reaching out to the indigenous folks in Oregon, it's probably important, you know, to just have this stuff in the back of your mind, you know, and, and just, yeah, be be sensitive to that. That's all. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I thought I'd talk talk for a little bit about ethnomycology. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, the study of the uses, beliefs, and practices connected with fungi uh, by specific cultural groups. That's a pretty broad definition. And by that definition, I mean, you know, you, you, you could even look at, say, for example, the, <clears throat> you know, the, um, I guess, the underground um, work with uh, Cubensis and wood lovers uh, by folks in the Pacific Northwest, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s. And that could also be considered ethnomycology. Um, but, uh, but it's typically it's restricted to indigenous and, 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 uh, and local, very localized cultural groups. But I think, I think, According to that definition, I mean, you could approach it pretty broadly. Um, so fungi are used traditionally by the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island for food, medicine, textiles, and also for ceremonial purposes. And so I guess I'll be focusing mostly on, on fungi for medicine, medicinal and spiritual purposes in this talk, um, given the time constraints, and also uh, perhaps also given the surprising volume of material that there is on the traditional use of fungi. So I'll just touch on a few key points. Um, <clears throat> so Harriet Kuhnlein and Nancy Turner, uh, a couple of, uh, well, Kuhnlein is a nutritionist and Nancy Turner is a pretty well-known uh, Pacific Northwest ethnobotanist. Um, in, a, in a large paper that was published, I think in the early 90s, but reissued in 2020, um, they suggest that the relatively low incidence of apparent traditional use, um, given the abundance of fungi in many Turtle Island ecosystems, may be attributable to the lethal toxicity of some species and the difficulties distinguishing toxic from edible fungi. Um, I don't actually, I don't, I don't really buy that, to be honest. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's some recent work by uh, MCAT Anderson and Lake 2013 on the ethnomycology of Californian indigenous peoples. Um, and even some of Nancy, Nancy Turner's earlier work on the, uh, on the ethnobotany of the Incla, Incla, I mean, uh, revealed that many indigenous cultural groups in California and even in British Columbia, traditionally used many species of higher fungi for food and medicine. I suggest that uh, indigenous traditional mycological knowledge is far deeper and more nuanced than what is reported in the literature, um, but it has gone relatively unrecognized for a couple of reasons. One, uh, what I've, from my, my experience, I've found that fungi play important spiritual roles in various indigenous cultures, and we'll see some of that in the coming slides. Um, and so given the colonial reaction to and persecution of ceremonial practices like the potlatch, for example, um, it's no wonder that so-called native informants kept quiet about mycological knowledge and, and, and even continue to. Um, so, I mean, really another, another reason why I think we see the low incidence of, of uh, reported traditional use is also that colonialism and all of its brutal, brutal manifestations has resulted in the loss of, of some of this mycological knowledge. <clears throat> okay, so uh, ethnomycology uh, as a Western academic discipline arguably began with the banker and amateur mycologist R. Gordon Wasson's discovery uh, of the sacramental use of psychoactive mushrooms in the Venus psilocybe 
and Huautla de Jimenez, an indigenous Mazatec village in Mexico, Sierra Mazateca in the mid 1950s. Uh, what you see on this on the screen is a, the centerpiece of the Time Life magazine article from May 1957, uh, authored authored by Gordon Gordon Wasson, um, and that article really uh, propelled the sacred mushrooms to prominence in the 1960s and 70s counterculture movement. <clears throat> the um, and the mushroom tourism uh, resulting from Wasson's so-called discovery uh, left an indelible mark on Wildla and the Mazatec people, and perhaps even the mushrooms themselves. And so the woman pictured uh, to the uh, to the right is Maria Sabina, the curandera, Mazatec curandera, who is R. Gordon Watson's primary source. <clears throat> um, and so this uh, Mazatec traditional healer, Maria Sabina, specifically asked Watson not to reveal her name or photographs of the velada or sacred mushroom healing session that she graciously invited him to attend. <clears throat> Watson felt betrayed uh, by, uh, sorry, Watson betrayed. Wasson betrayed Sabina's confidence uh, to his benefit and her detriment. Uh, quite likely resulting from Wasson's discovery, Maria Sabina was harassed by police, jailed, her house was burned down, and she died in penury. Um, so, I mean, you can see it hardly seems fair. So, uh, so here in Turtle Island North, mushrooms figure prominently in both Indigenous creation teachings and also in ceremonial practices. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the coming couple of slides. <clears throat> I love this. This is a reproduction of an uh, argillite plate uh, that was um, created by uh, Ida, Ida artist Charlie Charles at the at the end of the 19th century. Um, and so if you take a look at the back of the canoe, that's Fungus Man, who some people think is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> embodied by Ganoderma aplanatum, uh, the artist's conch. So uh, Ganoderma aplanatum uh, plays a pivotal, pivotal role in the Haida creation or Haida teaching about the origin of women. According to the story originally told by John Skye to anthropologist John Swanton, Raven at the very front of the canoe, um, sets out in a canoe to collect female genitalia, which seem to be climbing all over each other on a certain reef. Raven invites Junko, Stellar's Jay, and Tree Fungus Man to crew his boat. Of the four crew members, only Tree Fungus Man could withstand the overwhelming power of the genitalia, allowing the crew to collect the female genitalia, which were then carried back to land and stuck onto Raven's wife and sister, creating the first women. I mean, it doesn't get more profound than that, you know, when you think about that, the creation of women in the, in the traditional teachings. <clears throat> the, um, the irrepressible R. Gordon Wasson also worked with Anishinaabe traditional healer Kiwe Dinakwe, who shared traditional teachings about the use of misquedo or emanita muscaria uh, for shamanic travel and healing. Kiwe Dinakwe uh, wrote about emanita muscaria, emanita muscaria in an article published in uh, 1979, and also in a little book called Papawi for the People, which was published, I believe, uh, this could be a second edition, I'm not sure, but in the late 90s. Um, Papawi is a word for mushroom in Anishinaabe Muin, which is the Anishinaabe language. And as Robin Wall Kimmerer explains, the, refer the word refers to the action of mushrooms erupting from the ground, or this is a quotation um, from her braiding sweetgrass book, uh, the force which causes mushrooms to push up from the earth overnight. Papawi apparently is also a euphemism for other things that uh, push up. Not to, uh, <clears throat> not to go too far off topic, but this reminds me of Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Weisner's notion of indigenous transmotion. For Weisner, and this is another quotation, the learned botan botanical name Cypripedia macaulay, for instance, inadvertently denatures the exquisite poetic blush of a moccasin flower in the moist shadows and other more common names and comparative similes lessen the motion of images such as the heavy breath of bears, the marvelous shimmer of early morning dew, twilight favors on a spider web, raven's tease of hunters in camouflage, stray shadows lean over the fence or the perfect dive of a water oozel in a mountain stream. There's a lot more to say about indigenous transmotion, but I'll, I'll leave it at that um, in the interest of time. And if, I mean, if anyone wants to talk about it more, we can certainly do that later um, or in the question period. Um, okay, so uh, um, Richard Evans Schulte's 
Albert Hoffman and Christian Ratch uh, report the use of Amanita muscaria among the dog rib, who are a Dene people from the Northwest Territories in Canada. Schultes and his colleagues Dene uh, respondent clearly describe ego dissolution and encounters with non-corporeal entities, both of which have been described as elements of the psychedelic experience more broadly. So this is, this is I was so happy to discover this, to find this paper, it's so interesting. Um, so, uh, so Amanita pantherina, uh, species related to Amanita muscaria and with similar hallucinogenic properties, has been used for spiritual purposes since at least the early 20th century by some Ajamawi people in the Fall River Valley, southeast of Mount Shasta, California. This paper also reveals that mushroom use, not surprisingly, is phenologically calibrated, so calibrated to the seasons, and uh, community practiced, as evidenced in the following quotation from that paper. Um, when the red bells, Johnny jump ups, and dogwood start to bloom, the mushroom hunt comes in. Edible mushrooms begin to appear on the lower slopes of large mountains near the end of March. A variety of different mushrooms, both edible and hallucinogenic, are hunted at various times throughout the year. Each family, band, and individual has their own traditional mushroom hunting location. So, I mean, from the sounds of things, and that was only in 2005, I mean, that's a, a real living practice. What's the word I used before? Um, embodied, entangled, and emplaced. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so one thing I found over the years is that polypores seem to be seem to figure um, most prominently um, in uh, in ethnomycological use of fungi by indigenous people. And so uh, so carved um, fomatopsis or Larissa fomies of the Nalus fruit bodies were used to guard shamans' graves by indigenous nations. In coastal British Columbia. Um, the name for this fungus translates as bread of ghosts in two indigenous languages. Polypores such as Ganoderma aplanatum, which was pictured a little while ago, um, Fomatopsis panicola, and possibly Larisophomys officinalis were called echo makers by several coastal British Columbian First Peoples for their ability to reflect evil thoughts back towards the person who sent them. <clears throat> Haploporus odorus has a history of traditional use by the Blackfoot peoples of the Northern Plains. Uh, this uh, this anise-smelling aromatic fungus was used in medicine bundles, affixed to war robes, and associated with other artifacts to ward off illness and presumably to offer spiritual power and protection. The same authors also report the contemporary use of this fungus in medicine bundles by Cree traditional healer by a Cree traditional healer who indicated that uh, Haploporus odorus, and this is another quotation, opens the door to the spirit world and allows me to see and hear spirits. So you can see that, you know, even in contemporary times, you know, many of these fungi have very profound, um, have been integrated in a very profound way into the, the cosmologies of indigenous peoples. Um, Okay, so I'd like to take a moment to talk uh, briefly about two community-based groups that either directly or indirectly deal with fungi. The first um, that's pictured down on the bottom left is the Traditional Native American Farmers Association, and that's based out of Suki Pueblo in New Mexico, and that's run by a guy from there, Louis Kina, and a Mohawk, Clayton Bracope, who, who lives there. Um, the TNAFA delivers courses on Indigenous agriculture and community development. Uh, I took the course last year. Uh, it's fantastic, um, amazing people. And a number of the virtual site visits included meeting small scale indigenous farmers who were using or planning to use fungi for food, soil building, recycling woody debris and more. So over here on the on the right is uh, the Instagram, a screenshot from the Instagram page of the People of Color Fungi Community. Um, they're based out of San Diego, California, Mario Ceballos, an indigenous person is their primary contact. The POC fungi uh, community hosts events. Um, they support uh, local fungi-centric artists, entrepreneurs, and more. And they have a pretty active web presence on Facebook and Instagram. And I've, I've, I, I know Mario to some extent, we've had a few conversations and they're such a wonderful, kind person. It's a, like a really fantastic group. Um, yeah, so those are only two examples of indigenous mushroom initiatives, but I'm sure that there will be more if there aren't already. And I bring these groups up because sometimes we look at ethnomycological knowledge and much of it is framed in the past tense. While this may be the case with some of the examples that I've shared in the past few slides, 
it's not always the case. Uh, for example, um, with the Ajumawi in California who engage in the contemporary use of Amanita pantherina for spiritual purposes, um, and the community examples that I've just shared here. Um, those reveal the ways in which mycological knowledge is being mobilized by indigenous people to address contemporary aspirations. <laughs> it's a really uh, crazy image. <laughs> so uh, despite the millions of dollars that psychoactive mushrooms have generated um, since Wasson's discovery, quote unquote, and their current estimated market value, which I think, I mean, some sources put it over a billion dollars, maybe even a billion and a half. I've seen it. That's the, the, the lowest estimate that I've seen. Um, the countless careers that have been launched are bolstered by psilocybe mushrooms and the numerous people that have enjoyed their therapeutic effects. The Mazatec people and other, other indigenous folks in Mexico who, who stewarded, stewarded these medicines for probably millennia um, have seen little compensation beyond the ambiguous benefits associated with mushroom tourism and a line or two of attribution in some recent research papers dealing with psychoactive science. Um, a recent paper by Gerber et al. published this year, um, 2021, um, is calling for redress and restitution for the theft of this sacred traditional knowledge from the Mazatec people. So I guess with my last, my last slide, uh, I'd like to go into some suggestions. Uh, and you know, these are just suggestions that are based on my, my own lived experience and things I've read and thought about, and, and conversations with um, folks like Jesse and, and Angela. <clears throat> about, you know, about the work that, that you all are trying to do here. Um, okay, so I guess one of the things is, is I think, you know, for, for, for all of us who are involved in, in some way with the legalization or decriminalization movement, to slow down and take the time to deeply consider our relationship with the fund back. I had a recent conversation with uh, an Australian academic, Michelle uh, Bronstein. She's a very well-connected uh, person with the indigenous community there. And some of her indigenous knowledge keeper colleagues and friends strongly suggest that non-indigenous mainstream needs to reorient their approach to sacred medicines. Michelle and her colleagues make a very good point, and I'd, I'd like to echo that here. If the so-called psychedelic renaissance unfolds like everything else these days in this uh, neoliberal extractive capitalist environment, the opportunities for individual, family, community, and even planetary healing, I'm afraid that they'll be missed. I suggest that we on Turtle Island take the time to consider and reorient our relationships with the psilocybes and really all our relations, including each other and place. Um, the legalization of psilocybin in Oregon, it could really be a watershed moment for the mainstream's relationship with psychedelic plants and fungi and the more than human. Okay, so the second one, uh, solicit feedback from indigenous intellectuals regarding some of the key issues. Uh, from my experience, each indigenous nation or confederacy has homegrown intellectuals. These people are not necessarily university academics, and they, they have been schooled in indigenous thought by knowledge keepers and others. Imagine inviting indigenous intellectuals from Oregon tribes to help you think through some of the pressing issues that you face as an advisory group, and, and also be open to the emergent issues identified by those folks. Um, a couple of the um, issues that I could imagine warranting consultation could include things like, does genetically engineered yeast to produce psilocybin allow the yeasts and the mushrooms to fulfill their obligations to creation? Do extracts from psilocybe species have the same healing and spiritual power as the mushrooms themselves? And then also, how can psilocybes be reframed as medicine rather than drugs of abuse? How can we shift that damage-centered narrative that is really a consequence of the war on drugs, which is also a war on people, um, so that indigenous people can see psilocybin species as both a spiritual and therapeutic option, and not just a recreational drug for spiritual seekers or, uh, or, or of the mainstream middle class. <laughs> so uh, the third point, um, I guess, establish an indigenous advisory group to provide input on all matters related to the legalization of psilocybin in Oregon. Uh, the members of this group must foreground uh, representatives from Oregon's tribes as well as indigenous peoples with relevant expertise in healthcare, uh, particularly from cultures with a living tradition of psychoactive mushroom use. Uh, this indigenous advisory committee could think through how to reorient the mainstream's extractive relationship with psychedelics, uh, serve as or play a role in establishing an indigenous ethics watch um, to approve or at least endorse or not 
um, research projects or corporate activities related to the sacred mushrooms, and also potentially play a facilitation and advocacy role in ensuring that Indigenous peoples have equal access to psilocybes and all of the um, opportunities sort of associated with this groundbreaking legislation. This could include mentorship and training opportunities and even more. <clears throat> Um, work towards legalization of wild harvested and outdoor grown psilocybes. Um, as I shared earlier in this presentation, uh, territory or place is foundational to indigenous thought and existence more broadly. For this reason, it is of critical importance to work towards the legalization of wild harvested and outdoor grown psilocybes. The Pacific Northwest is home to a great diversity of psilocybin containing mushrooms, including many white rot psilocybes. Many of those white rot species are implicated in, in what's called woodlover's paralysis, which I know as a, as a group you've, you've discussed already. Um, and that's quite possibly due to the metabolism of secondary compounds from the woody substrate. However, some woodloving species, such as Psilocybe ovodio cystidiata, which is not native to the Pacific Northwest, um, can fruit from other substrates, such as pasteurized straw. Perhaps some of the wood, de wood decomposing psilocybes from Oregon are more general than we realize in terms of their substrate preferences. Safety reasons, of course, that would require much more study. Having said that, there are also cultivatable coprophilus psilocybin-containing species from Oregon, which definitely grow on 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 uh, on amended uh, bulk substrates like straw. Um, and those include things like Peniolus subaltiatus and potentially Psilocybe fimentaria, and even the Liberty Cap Psilocybe semilanciata, although semilanciata does not seem particularly suited to cultivation. Final thought on this topic. Is there room for semi-outdoor cultivation in the legislation, um, such as in hoop houses that are partially open to the wind, insects, sunshine, and rain? This would give the mushrooms a chance to have a more fulsome life than what's possible in sterile laboratory settings. So I guess um, I guess my, my final point here, and this may seem like a bit of a, an add-on or something, but I think it, it bears mentioning. Um, a portion of the state revenue associated with the legalization of psilocybin could be used to support indigenous peoples in Oregon to better access psilocybin, but also to build capacity to participate fully in the, in the opportunities that this legislation affords. Um, some of this uh, revenue could be used to give back to the indigenous cultures that have stewarded these medicines for millennia. Um, while I realize uh, that this Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board, oh, and actually I should backtrack, so. I, by that, I mean like folks like the Mazatecs or other indigenous peoples in Mexico who've, you know, who've really, I, I think in many ways have suffered because of um, you know, the West's indulgence in psilocybin mushrooms and, and psychedelics more broadly. Um, so yeah, I guess like I was saying, while I realize that the, the, this Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board is a voluntary commitment, it's also important to recognize that indigenous people are often asked to contribute to dif different initiatives for free including but not limited to extractive research projects. Um, involving indigenous peoples in a good way includes financial compensation for their time. And, and that includes, I guess, particularly when it comes to long-term commitments. Um, so from, from my limited understanding, um, all of you who are here today are in a position to influence the ways in which this legislation is culturally framed and implemented. And I, I hope that you'll consider some of these suggestions um, I look forward to talking more about all of this during the question period, and I'm happy to be available to the product subcommittee at any time in the future to talk more. Uh, and with that, um, if anyone wants to contact me, you could probably get my information from Angela or Jesse, but also here's my email. And if you want to see some of the stuff I've written about, there's my research gate profile with my, sorry, that's a bit of a bragging picture. I'm my huge squash that I grew last year, but yeah, oh good. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, and, and like I said before too, there's you know the attributions for the photos and some references, but let's leave that there. So yeah, so maybe I'll stop sharing my screen and, and uh, yeah, and that's, that's it for me. Thank you for, for inviting me to join you today. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, I have several questions that I'd love to pose, but I also want to open it up to other folks who might want to ask some questions. So maybe we'll start with that. 
Is there anyone who is a board member, subcommittee member who would like to ask a question at this at this time? Yeah, hi, it's David. I, I don't have a question. I'm going to have to step away. So I just want to say thank you for the presentation. I found it very interesting and, 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 and helpful. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right. Is there anyone else with an interest in a question or starting a discussion about what we just learned? I have a question. First, uh, a comment. Thank you so much, Pete. That was really, really great and informative and thought provoking. And I would love to get your slides. I'm not sure if it'd be possible to, to post them with the meeting minutes, but it would be wonderful to have um, and to use with credit. Um, I'm curious. So I have actually a lot of questions and comments, but I'll start with my first, which is about um, you touched on this topic of the difference between using whole mushrooms or whole plant medicines versus extracts, concentrates, um, subcomponents. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Um, how do, you know, how is this topic approached? Um, that's a great question, Jesse. And thank, thanks also for your kind words. Um, you know, I, you know, I would say like I keep coming back to one of Maria Sabina's comments. Uh, that's the uh, the Mazatec curandera that uh, was Wasson's primary um, informant. Um, and so, uh, so I think if I remember correctly, it was like maybe in the late '50s, early '60s. I think it was uh, Albert Hoffman had synthesized psilocybin in the lab in Basel, and then and then he he you know he, he took it back to he and Wasson maybe returned to Wautla in Mexico with these synthesized, with the synthesized psilocybin. Initially, Maria Sabina tried them and said, oh, this is great. This is, you know, the spirit of the mushroom. But then she revised her opinion and said afterwards that actually this is, you know, dead and this has nothing to uh, offer us. Um, so it really, it really, I guess that comment in many ways came from, from reading, reading about that and thinking about that. Um, you know, from from my own experiences, what I've what I've seen is that you know, uh, the indigenous traditional healers that I've worked with over the years, you know, many of those folks prepare medicines in different ways, including <clears throat> making you know aqueous extracts and and you know um, like um, uh, like oil extracts, things like that. So I think you know I think there's you know there's room for that. I f I feel like there's room for that based on what I've seen and learned. Um, but I think it would have to be done in a way that respects the integrity of the mushroom, and 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 it's 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 personhood and it's being, you know. So, but I guess it's just the intent and also how it's approached. I, I don't know if that helps or not. But. That did that is yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin uh, Fitz. I'm a mental health consumer and advocate on the. Uh, psilocybin board. I have a question. Maybe let me see if I can articulate it uh, precisely. So in my research or in my readings about particularly Western culture dominated by Freud and the psychological movement, the definition of we you you know, one of the in moving forward into what is the goal? What is this, etc. around take the psilocybin it impacts the definition of Western psychologies, you know, ego death or ego mm -hmm. subsuming it, putting it back on the back burner. How does that, how does that connect with or translate to um, indigenous folks understanding uh, of what the fic, what, what the goal is, what the magic is, you know, when they don't come to you know, a Sigmund Freud idea of the self and the ego and that sort of thing. Um, maybe my question isn't as tight or precise, but uh, maybe you get the idea of what I'm trying to get at. If the my initial use of psilocybin was to promote ego death, so I could take a clear look at myself, how does, does that translate? Or is there anything in those traditions that speak to something similar to that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, I'm also Kevin. informed by the work of Julian James and the uh, theory of bicameral conscious, you know, the bicameral mind previous to the, uh, you know, to uh, 1000 BC. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you, Kevin. And uh, I also should say, Kevin, thank you for your comment in the uh, in the chat box too. That's a really excellent point that you bring up there. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll try to answer your question as best I can. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting to me, you know, when I read uh, Richard Evans Schulte's report of the use of Am Amanita muscaria in among the dog rib, is that you know he clearly described what you know what sounded like ego death to me, um, and uh, and um, it's hard to know whether that's you know that was something that you know was overlaid because of his you know his own Western assumptions as he was you know talking with these folks in in the Northwest Territories, or or if that you know sort of authentically was was how that person would have described their own experience with that mushroom. So I'm not sure about that. Um, one thing that I guess I've found is that uh, in in, indig in the indigenous community, um, a lot of the focus, I mean. I, I'm sure ego death can happen. I know it well, I know it can. Um, but I feel like that the emphasis tends to be on ancestors and and um and all of our relations. You know, and so and so if ego if ego is if one's ego dies in that process or or is put on the back burner, put on hold during that process, great, but the emphasis seems to be more on on all of our relations. Uh, recognizing the person and the connection with more than human, but also thinking about our our ancestors and our future ancestors, <clears throat> the babies. <laughs> so, so I don't know if that answers the question or not, Kevin. But but I, I, like that's that's from my perspective, that's what I see as more as as the emphasis. Very good. Thank you. World. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the good question. There are other questions at this time. I can maybe grab one and throw it in here. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and they're they're kind of big topics. So, you know, take small bites, what whatever you can chew in this moment. Um, but so my first question is. Uh, likely for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned during your presentation, um, our seat on the board for a tribal member is not yet filled. Um, so considering what you spoke about this legacy of, of harm and the reasonable mistrust at this point, how can we as a board or we as the OHA uh, reach out respectfully and ask folks from the indigenous community to join us in our work and more importantly how can we create a table that someone from an indigenous community would want to join us at like what what do we need to do to create a setting in which someone feels like their voice would be heard wow those are big and important questions um angela thank you and i would say um you know, the first thing I would do is, I mean, I would sort of reach through your personal networks and, um, and, and, um, and I, I can actually do the same. I, I mean, I don't really know too many folks in Oregon, but, but I have, have some people who are quite well connected, uh, indigenous folks who are well connected in the Pacific Northwest in general. Um, but I would say, I would say reach through your networks and, uh, and, um, and it's really important to choose the right person. And uh, I think I, I mentioned earlier in, um, you know, in my, I guess the recommendation slide is that, you know, there, there are these homegrown intellectuals. And I think that's, that's the kind of person you really want, like someone with, um, someone who's well-respected in their community, who has some authority and has some, I, mean, I hate to use this term, but, you know, people talk about social capital, you know, and that's, it's kind of a crass term, but, um, <clears throat> you know, but I, I would say that's the type of person you need, someone who's a real thinker, someone who's grounded in the culture, but also someone who has some influence. And, and I guess how to find those people, I think the best way is through those personal networks, through existing relationships. Because I think that, you know, if it's, if it's an anonymous kind of, um, you know, uh, unconnected kind of advertisement or cold call or something, it might, I don't know how well received that would be. I mean, it could be, it could be, but it just really depends. But I, I think you, you'll have more luck with the personal group. Um, and your second question, how can you create an environment that's a little more 
um, like maybe that's welcoming to those to, to that person. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I think maybe maybe you know an invite like with the invitation, you could probably craft a kind of a I don't know maybe a statement in terms of your you know your you know like I guess your perspective on indigenous knowledge and indigenous people and, and territory and those kind of things you could you could craft something like that that you know if someone you know were to read it they would they would think okay these people understand where we're coming from and and, and you know and, and I would feel safe with them you know so that that may be a thought and I think also there are things you can do in your meetings like you could probably like you know when that when that person arrives or even even if that you don't find a person but I think things like territorial acknowledgements are very powerful um Particularly, I mean, I know and oftentimes they're misused and they're just used as a box check sort of um, approach to, 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 you know, to, uh, I don't know, virtue signaling, I suppose you could say. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you know, if, you know, it's important to do those things, but to do them in a personal and meaningful way. So it's a real personal reflection. And I think something like that would be good. Um, I think also if, you know, if there are some ideas around how, like how indigenous people could benefit or engage with, with this legislation. I think, you know, so, so whoever that person is could see um, what's in it for the indigenous community that, that might also help. So I guess those are just a few preliminary thoughts, but I'm happy to, you know, think about that more with you at any point, you know, if you want to just talk about it again or go through some stuff. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. I have another, if I may, we have a few minutes left. Um, so we are tasked with creating, well, we, we are tasked with creating the basis on which the codes, the laws in Oregon uh, will be enacted. How do we codify uh, an acknowledgement of the indigenous wisdom that has brought us to this place where we have the opportunity for this program uh, in a way that offers concrete reparation and restitution to Indigenous communities. Do you have any thoughts on how we would integrate that into the law? And again, I know that's a big question for just a few minutes left. So whatever your thoughts might be are much appreciated. Sure. No, a, a fantastic question, Angela. And you know, I am... Um... That may be one that we should return to, but I, but just mm. off the top of my head, a couple of things that I would say is, you know, one thing one thing we're seeing is this movement around um, recognizing the legal personhood of, of rivers and uh, and um, and the earth. Like I think in Bolivia, they recognize the personhood of Pachamama, um, and I think in uh, Quebec they recognize the personhood of the river. I think they've done the same thing in New Zealand, and uh, and a lot of that's coming from an indigenous perspective. And so I think if there's any way to recognize the personhood of the mushrooms and their inherent rights, that would be that would be important. Um, you know, again, the land back movement is another thing that's really important. And I think if there's any way to uh, to tie this legislation to land and and so that indigenous people can see um, how I don't know, maybe if it could support um, indigenous sovereignty related to territory, I, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like. But but that that would probably be really important. Um, I think another thing that's really important too is if you know if there's any way at all to ensure that um, you know whether it's whether it's special dispensation or special um, like a special status. Um, so for indigenous people or indigenous knowledge to be in a way privileged and in a recognition, you know, because I guess one thing. Sorry, I feel like I'm. You know, falling all over myself here, but um, you know, one thing that I've I've noticed is that um, indigenous people are often construed as yet another stakeholder. You know, so we've got you know we've got business, we've got academics, we've got government, and we've got indigenous people. You know, and and they're viewed as as in a way on par with all these other stakeholders. And not that I'm trying to set up a hierarchy, because in many ways that's you know that would be non-indigenous way of approaching this, um, but. Uh, but I think that um, that recognizing that that millennial millennial long stewardship and and respect for the mushrooms and respect for the land from which they came, I think um, I think and then 
and then seeing where, like thinking about it in that way and seeing where that takes you with the legislation or the rollout, I think that would be really important. So I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I answered the question well, but again, Angela, I'm quite happy to return to that at any point if you'd like to talk more. I would absolutely love to continue the conversation. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I, I feel like I dominated the conversation a little bit here. Uh, is there anyone else with any questions or comments before uh, we wrap up this wonderful presentation? I have one more, if I may. I also feel like I'm hogging the mic today. Um, so I'm very curious. And first of all, thank you for differentiating between the Western history of discovery of psychedelics and uh, history of usage in indigenous communities. I think that's a really important thing to do. And I'm wondering if you have insights into the timeline of mycological usage more broadly for food and medicine and psychedelics and also I assume that probably varies regionally and culturally if there are I guess part two of my question is if there are differences um, between how communities mm -hmm. associate with fungi because as you are well aware of there really are you know different species in different locations with different benefits and things and so I wonder if you have any insight into timeline of usage by by culture I'm looking for the who's and, and wins and where's yeah. That, that's a great, those are both great questions, um, Jesse, thank you. And you know, I would say to the first one, I don't, I mean, I don't really know. Um, I think what most people would probably tell you is that fungi like plants and animals, you know, have been our, our partners since time immemorial. Um, so I think that's probably the answer you'd get from most people. Uh, and the second question was around like the different different uses or different degrees of understanding by cultural group? Is that, was that right? Yeah, I was just okay. curious. I know within, um, for example, European communities, the perspectives towards mycological usage and in particular, let me give you an example, um, being open to foraging or eating mushrooms really varies from hmm. country and, and culture to culture. And, and I wonder if uh, the same is true, if uh, perspective and orientation to fungal usage and mycological knowledge differs by region or by culture? Definitely, 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 hugely. Um, you know, one thing, and this is coming from my lived experience, but also from my readings too. Um, I, I learned from reading that, um, that the, uh, I believe it's some, some of the Inuit from the Arctic, uh, despite there being mushrooms that grow during the summer, um, will not eat them. Um, and they refuse to eat them. They're supposedly very bad for you, that sort of thing. Um, but then there are other folks like, uh, like in California and BC, you know, who eat like, I mean, you know, I was going through this one paper by Kat Anderson and, um, and I can't remember his name, but Lake 2013 from California. And it was amazing, the list of, of edible fungi that zoomed. Like it was just like, I mean, I, I have it written down somewhere, but it's just like species after species. And so, I think there is quite a bit of difference. Um, and, you know, one thing I've noticed that I find really interesting is that um, in a lot of indigenous communities, fungi seem to have a kind of a, I mean, there's that spiritual or sacred piece. And a lot of them, as evidence of that, what I found is that a lot of them are almost treated with like a taboo, you know? So there, there is that as well. And I think that that points to, that points to something investors at something and, and underneath that taboo, I think there's probably, you know, there's either a, a contemporary or historic uh, reverence, you know? So, I mean, that's one possibility. So, but I'm afraid I didn't answer your question very well, but I do have one more thing to add if I can really quickly. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking about is the, the use of genetically engineered yeasts for psilocybin production. And, you know, my first thought is that is, oh my goodness, you know, this goes against the original instructions. And uh, most indigenous nations have these original instructions. And it's, um, you know, it's the idea that we all have our roles and, and you know, in our relationships, we you know that we're expected to, uh, to, to perform. And, uh, and, and, you know, we all have an obligation to fulfill those responsibilities to creation, which includes at a minimum, not interfering with other beings' abilities to fulfill their own obligations to creation. Well, you know, when I thought about that, I thought, okay, so 
what's that doing to the yeast and the fungi? Because you're essentially putting the fungi out of a job and you're, you know, you're messing with the yeast. But then I thought about the recent work out of, uh, I don't know, was it Michigan? I can't remember. But anyway, um, you know, that, uh, that, that work that suggests that uh, psilocybin um, has, uh, is, you know, is, is found in numerous clades um, because of horizontal transfer. And so if, if this gene metabolic gene cluster uh, that that's you know that uh, that's responsible for psilocybin production is mobile, I don't know if the word is transposon. I'm not sure, but if it's a mobile element, then I mean perhaps that is part of its original, one of its original construction. You know, I don't really know, but I think you'd probably need someone much smarter than me, you know, and, and who's far more grounded in traditional knowledge to answer that question. So, <laughs> but. But it's an interesting one, and, and I don't think it's easily solved, you know, or easily answered. <laughs> well, thank you so incredibly much for your time today and your energy and your thoughts. I found it really useful and um, very informative for the work that we're going to be doing. So Thanks. thank you very much. and. Um, you are, I mean, if you would like, you are more than welcome to hang out. Uh, I believe we have discussion at this point of some other, are there some other things on the agenda for today? I should, I, oh, go ahead, Keith. I probably should go. Please go ahead. Yeah. But thank okay. you so much for the invitation. It's been a real pleasure to, to, to you know, to meet you all and to, and to have a chance to chat with you. And it's it's great to see you, Jesse and Angela again. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your meeting. And I look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Thank Talk you to you soon. OK, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. So Angela, uh, we're slated until 1 um, and I suppose we can go into, we can have more discussion if that's appropriate, or we can also take pu public comment. Well, I guess I'll put it out to the group. Is there an interest in a conversation around what we just talked about and heard about? Does anybody have any thoughts? I think that would be great. Do you know any regional Pacific Northwest indigenous mycologists? Me personally? Or the group? The group, you, anyone? I unfortunately do not. I will search my extended circles. I'm sure that we'll find, find some. The point of invitation, I think, is a, a really important one. You know, this is a perspective that I think is really crucial to the work that we're doing. And I would love to find ways to bring an, a member to our board who is from an Indigenous nation, um, get input on what we are doing from indigenous communities. Um, the, the recommendations seemed to me to be spot on. Um, how we do that is sort of what is up in the air at this point. I wonder if anybody has any thoughts or ideas on how we might institutionalize that. I guess one question for Andy and Jeffy would be, um, are you still interested in, in searching for candidates to fill the un, unfilled positions on the board that were outlined in the measure, or would it be more of an internal um, mechanism as we've discussed and, and agreed on for adding folks perspectives? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jesse. This is for folks on the phone. This is Angie Albee, section manager with Oregon Psilocybin Services. 
Um, there is an open seat for a tribal member currently, as well as a number of other seats um, as directed by Measure 109. Um, the governor's office actually makes those appointments, not the agency. So um, I have a specific process. So if there's any, any interest at all, please let me know. And I'm happy to send that process to all of you or to whomever is interested. You can also have them email and we'll send them the information. We've had a number of requests. Um, as far as you know, um, additional members um, that aren't actually categorized by Measure 109 and governor appointed, I think it's really important to have indigenous perspective um, and whenever possible. And so I would, you know, I would say that if it's, if someone doesn't actually, you know, qualify for one of the, the open seats that the governor appoints for based on what's in Measure 109, that I think you know we would be probably happy to find plenty of um, opportunities to have that perspective be a part of, of either this group or even working closely um, in other capacities. So definitely, I know that we've got bylaws to go through in August and different processes to discuss, but I think that this is incredibly important. And I just wanna say thanks for bringing this up today or, or bringing the speaker to us. I was really excited to hear about the people of color fungi community and the traditional Native American Farmers Association. Um, and I wonder if maybe we could find some folks to talk about cultivation from that perspective at some point uh, from the Farmers Association. And potentially that might be that might be a good addition to uh, our speaker list potentially. Well, I am out of my prescripted question. Um, I, if anybody else, I think maybe we could move to public comment and see if there's anyone from the general public who might be interested in sharing in the conversation today. Hi, Angela, this is Nick Briley. Um, I just received one Hi, request for public comment from, from John Dennis. All right, John, would you like to go ahead? Thank you, uh, Angela. Thank you, everyone. And nice to see you all again. Um, the conversation about um, products and indigenous, um, kind of the, the intersection between indigenous use and indigenous history of products is um, interesting. Um, I know that there had been conversation earlier um, from Paul Stamets and I think others about the desirability of a sclerotia forming uh, mushrooms uh, species that as possible contenders for the um, cultivation under Oregon Psilocybin Initiative. Um, I know the um, rapid evidence review had kind of limited or made the recommendation that cultivation be limited to Psilocybe cubensis, but I'm wondering given the um, desirability on other levels, if it might be worth considering um, permitting uh, cultivation of Psilocybe mexicana, um, which was, I think, the preferred species um, used by Marita Sabina. Um, and it has the kind of the moder the species that has the longest, as far as I'm aware, and I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert in this, but the, the longest history of, of kind of uh, indigenous use as uh, uh, that extends into the, the modern time. Um, so I think her two species of uh, that she frequently used were uh, Psilocybe mexicana and Psilocybe k-relescence, and I think um, it might be worth considering those. Um, and I'm not aware of any kind of other uh, kind of toxicity issues, which I think were the concern of the um, kind of research subcommittee when it made those recommendations. So thanks. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Well, that's uh, that was the only public comment request that we received, Angela. Thank you. I, ha I have a okay, comment kind you, of Nick. on that um, on that comment. Hey, I, 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 I appreciate um, John's uh, comment about the sclerotia. I just wonder how we might move in a direction towards 
making recommendations of that kind? Yeah, if, if I may build on that, I think that's an important uh, topic. And um, I'm wondering subcommittee and board members, uh, when and, and how we plan to present, to discuss, we need more discussion and to present our recommendations to the full board. Um, that's something I, I will take accountability for between now and the next meeting is rethinking our timeline. I think it's really important to to have a conversation as a larger group about that topic, species diversity and also product diversity, because we've in the research re review, we have put forward um, a few preliminary conclusions, but they um, are in not yet in in fully board vetted recommendation form. So I think that's a point of clarification. Do we want to develop a document for the product subcommittee that has our set of recommendations? Is that, it sounds like that's where you're kind of going with that, but. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Um, I'm wondering timeline wise where that might fit in. So I suppose we have Ben uh, visiting us in the next meeting, not at mm -hmm. August. We could do it late August before we pivot to to testing. We could devote a a meeting to discussing and and uh, summarizing or soon. Sounds like a good idea to me too. Yeah. Am I uh, in line with what you're thinking, Mason? Were you thinking of something different? Yeah, I just I guess that's kind of my you know as more time goes by, I just get increasingly nervous about you know what the product recommendations will be just in terms of you know arriving at those because i'm not sure how much consensus there is in this group and uh, how much discussion might be necessary to arrive at recommendations and then, and then we're going to be introducing this additional element of testing on top of everything else. So just how to make that all function, you yeah. know, will be a balancing, a real, you know, be a real, it'll be a challenge. Valid. Yes. Um, I would say the one, one upshot is that, um, I don't think we are in a lack of consensus around the importance of, of testing and and regardless, developing standardized testing protocols will be applicable to any species and product that we put forward as suggestions. But I agree, logically, it seems like a natural first step to come to consensus on which species, species and product diversity, and then to move on to testing. So uh, let's do this. And then labeling, Jesse. Her, hello, yeah, Richard right. here. Lab labeling, and then what we're going to do about structure function claims, health claims, how that's going to be handled you know, enforced, et cetera. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Yeah, I mean, obviously everyone agrees that testing would be important and I doubt we'll have a whole lot of disagreement on, you know, the manner in which that's done. I think we'll all want testing to be done to the highest possible standards, but I think once we do decide on some product directions, that's going to open up a whole other, you know, whole other cans of question worms. Um, let me ask you this. So from your perspective on licensing, um, what sorts of information and what order do you need to proceed? I assume a lot well, of- Well, I mean, like what kinds of products will be available would be sort of the foundational foundational question and that might also affect training as well i'm not sure to what extent but i imagine it would you know if people are administering certainly yeah i mean that you know that that's going to affect what should be in the curriculum and what should be on the on the examination so i think there are a lot of things that kind of hinge on some of these 
foundational questions. Yeah, those are good points. Okay, well, let me do this. Um, I will take a look at our agenda after we have our last um, visiting speaker and plan some time for discussion and summary consent coming to consensus on some of these early decisions that other subcommittees and the full board need to weigh in on and to have to move forward. Um, I think it's it sounds very prudent to reserve some time to 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 have that and then also to um, hopefully on one of the full board agendas have a little more time to present some of our our conclusions with pros and cons for the larger board to consider. Excuse me. Sounds great. That sounds awesome. Are there other ways that um, that I can support folks from that are representing other subcommittees or other pieces of information that need to be handled sooner than later? Yeah, Jesse, there were there were a few remarks um, from the equity subcommittee. Um, really. Uh, uh, that we included in the report. So definitely access that. Um, there might be some specific conversations that need to be had from their perspective around types of products. Like the, the, the sclerosha conversation came up and there were concerns um, around that. And uh, there are members on the equity subcommittee who would be better, um, better equipped to have that conversation. And so we definitely wanna open up that line of communication. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm curious, is the report available on uh, the OAJ website or was that in, I'm, I've lost track of some of the emails and I apologize for that. This kind of brings up a good question that I've had recently is if there is like a central repository to see all these documents because I've been trying to find this outline of Tr uh, training curriculum, this like model training, model curriculum outline that was apparently circulated at some point. I can't seem to find it. It's not on the OHA webpage. So like, it seems like it'd be really helpful to have a central place where everyone could look instead of having to sift through all of our emails. And better for the public as well, because I don't think they can access a lot of these uh, documents very easily. All right, well, my, my conclusion is um, if, if we could recirculate the uh, recommendations from the equity subcommittee, um, that would be helpful for me. And, and I would also like to second that uh, some of these more pivotal and central documents, making summaries between subcommittees, if those could be centralized or at least refreshed, that would be, that would be helpful. And uh, let me own it, my email is a little crazy being a professor and also a very busy person trying to help with policy development. And I just, this is Angie uh, from the Oregon Psilocybin Services at FHA. Um, I just want to ask Nick if, um, give Nick the opportunity to discuss, um, you know, which documents he's been able to post on the website. Um, there has been a little bit of a delay in getting some of those up. So I wanna turn that over and give him an opportunity to speak to that. Um, also, there are some subcommittees that are using um, Google Docs, not as um, a place to comment or give editorials or to make decisions, but as a storage space for resources and materials. Um, and so, you know, I understand that everyone's been waiting to hear from the Department of Justice on guidance, but in the last meeting, we talked about how um, that particular um, use would be okay at this point in time. And if you send that mm -hmm. Google document link to us, um, we can get that posted on the website as well. Nick, do you want to share kind of where you're at with posting documents? Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. I mean, some of it's a matter of, of just personal capacity. I'm, I'm, I generally prioritize posting the notes and the recordings as soon as possible after the meetings. I haven't always been able to keep up with all of the documents and that's, uh, you know, that's something that I'll, I'll need to work on, but certainly in the last 
in the last month, I believe I've posted all of the meeting documents for all the subcommittee meetings. If there's anything that I'm missing, uh, Mason, please let me know and, and I'll, I'll be sure and uh, update the website as soon as possibly, as comprehensively as I can. And I apologize if there's anything that's that's been missing for too long. No worries at all. I totally understand. I, I, I the, the thing I'm not able to find is this uh, curriculum outline that was apparently circulated by the training subcommittee at some point in the past, but you know, I it's I haven't been able to locate it. Yeah, and I want to acknowledge on the OHA side, the support that we're getting is tremendous. It's an extraordinarily large job. So we thank you for your patience and, um, and energy and effort putting these things together. Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't uh, expect anything to, you know, th th this is all very challenging. I'm just brainstorming out loud that if we could think of a way to centralize things and i think that the google drive the google drive is a great idea like i i think i'll start making one for licensing so that you know people can easily see all the things we're working on Jesse, would you mind this is angie from oregon psilocybin services would you mind if i just mentioned one other piece just since we're on the topic i think it might be helpful to to everyone here yeah please um, go Thank you. Uh, so as you all know, um, Nick has been very kind um, to help with all of this work. And very soon we'll be recruiting for a position, um, you know, for administrative support. And so um, that person is going to have to go through lots of training and onboarding. And so I'm trying to really um, be mindful of how much um, Nick has been a tremendous resource and has gone above and beyond. And um, there's a lot of internal uh, work that also this role has to do, which takes up actually more time. Um, I would say at least, you know, 70% of the time, um, you know, for, to, to get this work done and so to support the team as we build. And so, um, you know, if there's some way that if you have any ideas for the agency or, um, you know, you want to talk about ways to organize, happy to do that. I just, this is why um, I continue to um, explain why, you know, we're, we're somewhat limited on capacity and that might be, um, you know, some time that, that that's the case. And so thank you for your patience and we'll keep you posted when we get that position recruited. It'll go out to all of you to circulate in your channels as well. Um, but Nick, thank you for all of your hard work and for being on loan to us um, as this work has, um, you know, been started and while we're building out our team. Thank you, Angie. I, I just want to say, I, I just double checked the training section. It does really need to be updated, and I will do that today. I'll put all of the training uh, meeting documents online by the end of today. And I apologize again. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate you. It's, it seems to me that there's an emerging theme that subcommittees are um, doing excellent work together, collaborative work, but perhaps um, not in communication with each other, awaiting the guidance on how to do that in an appropriate way. And um, I'm just brainstorming here. It may be helpful for subcommittees, like we're suggesting here, to create a summary document of our thinking and you know, some consolidated conclusions, potentially if we reach those as a group and, uh, and post them in a centralized place so that other groups, the public can can get insights into what we're thinking and potentially add new discussion topics. Definitely. All right, is there anything else that, uh, that we need to discuss today? If not, Thank you all for coming. Appreciate your time and effort. And we'll see you in two weeks for our last our last speaker in the series. All right. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Hope you have a good weekend. Almost there. Have a good weekend.